I'd like to welcome our expert panel here today to discuss oncology shaping the future of personalised healthcare and specifically how cancer drug development holds the key to success for precision therapeutic approaches. Um, just to introduce everyone to begin with, we have uh, Richard Stevens, Chair of the Consumer Liaison Group at the National Cancer Research Institute in the UK. And in that capacity, you obviously bring the important voice of cancer patients, uh, caregivers and relatives into research. And I know you're facilitating some really interesting work with the industry as well, so welcome. On my left, we have Ruth March, who is AstraZeneca's Head of Personalised Healthcare and Biomarkers and comes with around 20 years' experience in the genetics and personalised healthcare space. Welcome, Ruth. We also have over from the US, Maya Tomei, who has a particular interest in the diagnostic side and is chief exec of Myraka, um, with over 20 years' experience in the in vitro diagnostic space and obviously a particular interest in personalised healthcare as well. Thank you for joining us today. And finally, we have uh, Professor Malcolm Ransom from Manchester University, where he's Professor of Medical Oncology and Pharmacology and also Honorary Consultant at the Christie Hospital. Malcolm has a particular focus on apoptosis, cell signalling and biomarkers, so brings an important research aspect to this discussion. We're going to be talking about a number of aspects of personalised healthcare today. And just to set the scene, obviously it's been a very hot topic for a number of years now perhaps heralded by some of the early successes with drugs like Aceptin, first launched in 1998. Where, if we look at where we are now, obviously that significant promise to some extent may not have been lived up to, but equally some people say we're now at a stage where personalised healthcare is really about to take off. There are signs that you know, a number of new drugs are coming through, with almost a third of the drug approvals in 2013 being linked to a companion diagnostic approach already so far. Around 600 industry-sponsored trials taking place with a companion diagnostic element. Equally, we know there are a number of challenges with the regulatory landscape, with the reimbursement landscape, and indeed in education around the personalised healthcare space. So we'd like to cover off a number of those angles today. We'll go through a number of different topics relating to this. I'd like to start with you know, your views on what personalised healthcare really is and what has it achieved so far in the oncology space. I'd like to then move on to look at the healthcare systems. What is it that is perhaps missing or needs to be advanced in order to get these medicines to patients? And we will then critically look at the role for the pharma industry in this debate how pharma needs to develop and partner to bring these medicines to fruition. And finally, if we look at what we've learned in the oncology space, I'd like to look beyond and say, where is that taking us? What is the future of personalised healthcare beyond oncology? And what can we take from this? So I think a good starting point for this, really, is to look at how we describe personalised healthcare. There's a lot of terminology around this. We have personalised healthcare, we have personalised medicine, stratified medicine. People now talk about precision medicine. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to understand you know, your definition of what is personalised healthcare. Um, and perhaps, Maya, you'd like to, to kick things off with, with how you, you view this space, how you would describe it. Well, being a diagnostic person, that's really my, my focus. And so, I mean, there's an incredible amount of work that goes into developing these compounds and um, really finding the right test with the right cutoff, with the right sensitivity specificity is, is really key to a lot of this. So I guess my sense of personalized medicine is, is really finally combining the expertise that exists in pharma and in diagnostics and trying to bring those together. It's, it's tricky. There's a lot of issues that make those industries very different and how research is done in those industries very different. So I think we've, we've, got, we've, we've made a lot of progress in it, but there's still a long way to go. Malcolm, looking at that from the research perspective, would you say that that's pivotal and that, is that how you describe personalised healthcare, that mix of drug and, and diagnostic? Well, I guess, you know, as a clinician, we see it in, in, in you know, perhaps slightly small, um, slightly different terms. And so personalised medicine to me, you know, having grown up with it um, over the last couple of decades is, is really that ability to use molecular diagnostics to tell us which patient to treat, to try and be a little bit more, as you phrased earlier, about um, precision medicine, as it were. Um, you know, people talk about the, you know, the right drug in the right patient at the right dose. Um, we even now talk about, since we're 
thinking about cancer patients moving, you know, through their cancer history from you know early diagnosis through to refractory disease. Actually, think of it as actually also needing to be at the right time, so in the right in the right frame f uh, from that perspective. You know, from a cancer patient's perspective, what does personalised healthcare mean to them? To me, it's not personalised if it's based on something like DNA, molecules, genetics. Because I, I, I'm, I'm a person, I know those things are part of my makeup biologically, but actually I think and I feel and that there's something more sentient to personalised medicine. And I think personalised health care then actually goes down the route not just about what treatment you're having and what the diagnosis is, but it's actually about where you're treated. And are you actually at a hospital, depending on what your condition is, that will treat you as an inpatient, or do they prefer to treat you as an outpatient? I think stratified medicine, uh, as, as we tend to call it as, as patients working in cancer research, the idea that we're working on things that, that fit particular molecules in particular groups of people with particular conditions, that's quite different, and I think in cancer, breast cancer over the past 10, 20 years is a very good example of where we made advances. Some of the blood cancers, for example, are now virtually chronic conditions. But there are other cancers, pancreatic cancer, where there is virtually no progress. So again, I think, I think we're at the stage where personalised health care or even stratified medicine it's not about cancer, it's about cancers and which one you've got. And there are many patients who will still actually divide it into, into two types. There's the type of cancer that you're going to get over and there's the type of cancer that you aren't. I think, I actually personally think we are a long way from truly personalised healthcare. But the advances we've made are in molecular medicine and targeted therapies and I think that's different. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's very interesting hearing the views of everybody and the different opinions. And I must say that a few years ago we became aware that there were many, many definitions of personalised healthcare or stratified medicine or targeted therapy or whatever you want to call it. And um, we came to the conclusion it wasn't that useful to talk about the best phrase or the best definition. What we're talking about, I think, is as a pharma industry, is realising that when we produce drugs, it is about more than just those molecules to treat patients. It's about the whole experience, about knowing what the diagnosis is, about the tests that you may use, whatever goes around that, so that the best treatment gets to the right patients. So it may be a molecular diagnostic that we use, or it may be something very simple like uh, family history or a clinical, mm -hmm. you know, a clinical algorithm that just looks at the patient characteristics. All of those, to me, are personalised healthcare and we are using all of them to get the right drug to the right patient. You know, one of the sea changes that, you know, the transformational changes that I see occurring, you know, between, you know, what used to be empirical cytotoxic chemotherapy and more targeted therapy is that you know the quality of life differences that patients experience when you get personalised or stratified um, medicine and healthcare to work is is really a very different feel. Um, and you know I think coming back to the earlier point of of whether it's useful to sort of you know bring that out in, more into the open. Yes, I think you know patients you know could really describe that 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 sense of difference because many of them you know have experienced you know both, if you like, in empirical cytotoxic treatment and the more targeted um, personalised medicine approaches. And, and, it, and, you know, they will describe it as being, you know, transformational. Yeah. There, there, is, there is too, I think, that there's the other side of the coin to that. I, w I was really interested that the US are using a term precision medicine, which I have to admit I'd never heard before. But it strikes me as quite important because the other side of this agenda is knowing which things will not work in certain patient groups so that you don't give people drugs that are going to do no good whatsoever. Particularly important if you do have something else that might be available, a stem cell transplant, for example, or something like that. And I think, I think that's the other side that we sometimes forget. Finding out 
why things don't work in some groups of patients is equally important. So, so it is about both sides of the coin and avoiding toxicities because you know equally personalised medicines can, and you know, personalised healthcare approaches can be as much about dealing and avoiding toxicities as, as it is about efficacy. I think precision medicine has taken over in terms of an academic discussion about it and maybe even an industry discussion about it. But I don't know that precision medicine is something, if I said that to my mom or my brother, I don't know that they would know what I'm talking about. You know, I mean, I, I could talk about that, all, that they, they wouldn't get it. So I think from, a, from a, the, the folks that are working in the industry, I think that that term is. But even, you know, FDA has, they have an office of personalized medicine now. They, they've taken on the personalized medicine moniker. If we just step back from some of the language that's, that's used around personalised healthcare, if we look at the oncology space, has personalised healthcare delivered? And if so, what do we regard as really good examples of delivering success? To me, it's the, again, it's the transformational effect of some of those early examples. And I would think of drugs, of course, like Herceptin, which was originally approved for 20% of the breast cancer population within five years have, was treating, for the patients that had the appropriate biomarker, was treating over 90% of that population. So for those patients that had a worse prognosis and had very little treatment available to them, Herceptin then became almost the standard of care. And similarly, Gleevec, which was, had a very difficult time getting backing within the industry because it was directed at such a tiny population, became a clinical and a commercial success, not because the population was large, but because those patients who took it stayed on it. So rather than actually uh, dying within a few months, they went off to take Levac for a much longer period of time. And suddenly, you know, this, is, this became a, a drug which Pharma was interested in, and in fact, I think there have been now six follow up drugs at the same sort of population, and for those drugs, those patients that develop resistance. So, these are the sort of examples I think which transform the industry. The key question you must be asking, as anybody in the industry is asking, is what did we get so right with Herceptin and Gleevec that we need to do moving forwards? What should you on that? Yes, well, I think the key thing that many of us in the industry have realised is that you need to start early. But if you select patients in phase one in, in a clinical trial and then you see the response, uh, uh, there's been recent um, examples of that, like chrysotinib, then you see a remarkable result. Then you know that that drug really is going for the disease mechanism of, of the biomarker in the population that you're picking out. So I think then you have a compelling case to take to the regulatory authorities and of course you may get early registration and you may also get the reimbursement that's so important, particularly in the US. You know, Richard, I'd like to bring you back in here because you know, as well as dealing with a number of cancer patients, you have been a cancer patient yourself. You've got a very personal aspect on this. So for you, has personalised healthcare delivered in the oncology space? Yeah, well, I'm still here, so yes. Um, <laughs> but that, that is a, a, a very personal view. I, I think if you simply look at the numbers, then yes, because we have many more people surviving cancer for much longer than there used to be. Uh, and some of that is, is down to personalised medicine. For me, actually, yes, it's, it's really good news. And for lots of other people, it's really good news. But we, we still don't have enough of these treatments in enough cancers. And, and I do have some concerns that what we're doing, because we're so interested in molecules, is we're going down narrower and narrower fields. Um, when I sit on things like funding committees now, more and more trials coming forward are for smaller trials in much smaller groups of patients, which is really good news for them, really, really good news, and we want to go down that route. But at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely not sure that we're ever going to have 
big impact drugs again. So it's not a straight yes or no, it's we need it to work for more people. And, and I think you, you might be very interesting at an FDA meeting. This is actually a lot of the concerns that they express when we do want to select very early on, is they are concerned that maybe there is activity for a larger group of people than we're willing to study with that drug. So it, it is difficult. I mean, I think Ruth's point is really important. You can target the folks that are really going to respond to the drug, mm -hmm. but they're very concerned that we're, we are narrowing it too much. Maybe there is benefit for a lot more people than that selected group. As Richard, I think, has alluded to, one of the real dangers of personalised medicine is that we create um, areas of, of, of medicine, areas of unmet need that simply don't get addressed because there isn't a, a commercial or a, a, you know, an avenue that, that's open um, or it's a, it's a harder area to, to crack. Um, and that in the end, we, we create more and more Cinderella diseases, albeit in perhaps smaller populations than existed in our old empirical model.